The earliest reference for Chu Yuan in any text occurs in a lament for him written by the young statesman Jia Yi in 176 BC, more than a century after his death. Alone in your melancholy, to whom could you speak? Reads a line in the envoy to a poem called Morning Chu Yuan by Jia Yi. It echoes Chu Yuan's own words. Dispirited, downcast, dejected, foiled and forestalled. Alone, I endure the desperate troubles of these times. And this represents the irony of one of the two origins of poetry, as David Hawkes puts it, the expression of poets' feelings as isolated individual souls, that in exploring our interiority, we find that an audience is almost certainly guaranteed. For 2,000 years, and for thousands hereafter, barring cataclysm, Chu Yuan's lament will resonate and move kindred spirits as it did Jia Yi. Chu Yuan is a great many things, as a figure that transcends history and myth, and so will move back and forth between certainty and uncertainty between the man himself, his legacy, and his different cult aspects. Jia Yi had been banished to Changsha by the Emperor. It was also the area to which Chu Yuan had been banished, and where he had finally drowned himself in despair. Struck by what he saw as a similarity of their fates, Jia Yi was inspired to write this lament as an offering to the earlier poet's shade. The lament refers to Chu Yuan's nobility of soul and to his meeting with slander and rejection and drowning himself in the river Milwo. While unknown from any pre-imperial text, the story existed in several sources, some of which are patched together in Chu Yuan's only surviving biography in Sima Qian's Records of the Historian. And this overview of Chu Yuan will be no less a patchwork of my own, with quotes that overlap but are meant to give as clear a picture as we can reconstruct with limited time. Until the appearance of Sima Qian's biography of Chu Yuan some eight years after Jia Yi's mourning of Chu Yuan, that was the extent of what most people seem to have known about Chu Yuan. He was an honest minister of King Huai of Chu. He was banished from court because of some scandal or intrigue. He wrote the Li Sao to protest against the injustice of his dismissal. And having written the Li Sao, he committed suicide by throwing himself into the Mi Luo, a tributary of the river Xiang. Sima Qian's biography of Chu Yuan is far more circumstantial, but as a historical document of very uncertain value. Sima Qian can be said to have invented the art of biography in China but Chu Yuan's biography has a number of textual irregularities that indicate it was compiled by Sima Qian from sources of uneven quality and reliability. So even though it is our best source for his life, it is not entirely trustworthy. Chu Yuan, a virtuous minister of Chu, was banished because of a slander. He wrote the poem Li Sao ending with the words, Enough. There are no true men in the state. No one understands me. Then he threw himself into the river and was drowned. This brief account of him is found in the first century biography of Jia Yi in the history of the former Han dynasty, but is almost certainly based on material more nearly contemporary with Jia Yi the early 2nd century BC. 
Early Han references to Chu Yuan invariably speak of his writing the Li Sao after being banished by King Huai and of his throwing himself into the river after its completion. It was only later that a somewhat more elaborate curriculum vitae was worked out for him, in which allowance was made for his having written various other works. The late Guo Moro took this process to an extreme by giving him more than 20 years of busy, creative life between his estrangement from King Huai and his final suicide. At the age of 62, according to Guo's computations in the river Miluo. The historical Chu Yuan, we may be sure, did not long survive his disgrace. We may suppose that he died sometime in the middle years of King Wai's reign, say about 315 BC. Before the series of defeats and disasters which culminated in King Wai's death in Qin, in 296 BC. But to say that Chu Yuan was an able, honest courtier who fell out of favour, wrote the Li Sao and drowned himself, that, after all, is a sum of what most Han informants seem able to tell us about him, is hardly a story at all. How much more interesting to let him live on so that he could witness the dreadful price that King Huai had to pay for not heeding his repeated admonitions to the fair one to mend his ways. The distraught courtier who drowned himself when he fell from favour now becomes a prescient statesman who foresaw the ruin of both king and country and having lived to witness with anguish what he had foreseen, rang down the curtain on this great historical tragedy with his own calculated self-destruction. Over one-third of the works in the elegies are attributed to Chu Yuan, but there are doubts and complications regarding these attributions. Many pieces attributed to Chu Yuan are evidently Han dynasty imitations. Regardless of the historical details though, he remains a central figure in the anthology since so many of the poems are dedicated to eulogizing him, the great martyr, poet and overall cultural hero of early China. A cultural hero who has been celebrated and even worshipped for the past two millennia. Chu Yuan was not only China's first poet, but an incomparably greater poet than his successors. And his greatness has in no way diminished if we conclude that Li Sao is the only work that can, with certainty, be attributed to him, since no other work in this genre approaches Li Sao in originality and power. According to tradition, Encountering Sorrow, the Li Sao, is the first autobiographic poem in China, and Chu Yuan, the first Chinese poet known by name. In reality, he may be the subject, but not the author, of the texts attributed to him. Chu Yuan has never been viewed simply as an author, as his life story is deeply embedded in broader political, historical, and religious developments, not to mention that many of its details may have been invented or at least embellished by later interpreters. Later readers were irresistibly drawn to Sima Qian's portrait of Chu Yuan's virtue and sagacity, and for 2000 years he has been idolized as a political martyr, first and foremost. He even became an object of religious worship. At some point not long after his death, and certainly by the former Han, Chu Yuan's watery death began to be interwoven with the cult of an aquatic deity. Later on, he would become the universal object of popular worship, 
at the Duan Wu Festival, still celebrated throughout the Chinese world today. Duan Wu is celebrated on the fifth day of the fifth month with dragon boat races and rice dumplings wrapped in bamboo, which are said to be offerings to Chu Yuan's drowned soul. In fact, as when Yi Duo himself was the first to admit, the Double Fifth Festival is much older than Chu Yuan and was not associated with him until centuries after his death. The Swedish anthropologist Guren Eimer has very plausibly suggested that it was originally a fertility festival associated with the planting out of the race. The dragons, the Nagas of the river, not Chu Yuan, were the original recipients of the offerings, and the boats with their dragon-headed prows represented the beneficent powers who, it was hoped, would bestow fertility on the paddy fields. During the Sino-Japanese War of 1937 to 1945, it became a fashion to represent Chu Yuan as the great patriot poet, even as the people's poet. An article by the great liberal scholar Wen Yi Duo was actually published under the second of those titles. It ended with these words. Although Chu Yuan did not write about the life of the people or voice their sufferings, he may truthfully be said to have acted as the leader of a people's revolution and to have struck a blow to avenge them. Chu Yuan is the only person in the whole of Chinese history who is fully entitled to be called the people's poet. The transformation of Chu Yuan into a saint of Chinese state ideology must have had many chapters and phases, but a brief overview of CCP state media websites produces a sterile look at the person and poet. He is time and time again mentioned as a patriotic poet, one who is faithful to the state of Chu, despite the common practice of officials traversing the entire realm to search for better employment. And while neither the historical nor poetic biography relates any success in other endeavours, it seems remiss to imply Chu Yuan does not look for greener pastures during his exile. At the outset of his search, he says, I yoke jade dragons and I ride upon a phoenix. Now the tempest rises and I will soar aloft. Though the road is long and seems to have no end, I will seek throughout the world above and below. What the CCP ideologues believe he sought perhaps should be the goal of our own fantastic journey. Chu Yuan fails to commit to another master because he finds none worthy of his excellent virtues. There is none here with whom to rule in harmony. This seems like faithfulness to the right path, to his values and to himself more so than to the state of Chu. But we cannot expect their ideological influence to be light, nor the spirit of a man as an individual to be something of value under the auspices of a regime synonymous with cultural desecration. Chu Yuan was not displaying the sort of loyalty we should associate with an intelligence officer who chooses to blow his brains out rather than defect to a foreign power. Loyalty of that kind implies an idea of nationalism totally unheard of in Chu Yuan's day. Rather, he was demonstrating the chivalrous, aristocratic kind of personal loyalty, which Zi Chan would very well have understood, but which in the thoroughly liberated world of the 4th century was remarkably old-fashioned. Best known for his poem Li Sao and the anthology of Chu Tzu, 
Chu expresses his love and passion for his country and the sadness and suffering of the ordinary people through numerous metaphors. If by ordinary people this means himself alone, perhaps this starts to make sense. Writing the voice of Lady Shu, he addresses himself with, Unlike alone, apart, you refuse to conform. It seems no question who Chu Yuan is most concerned with and whose sadness and suffering he gives voice to. Hawks writes, Throughout the whole of the poem, he remains in the forefront. I, I, I. He bears his breast to us, examines his motives, admits his doubts, reveals his aspirations, argues, cites historical precedents in defence of his opinions. In short, he is no mere bard or song maker like Ji Fu, but a poet. China's first poet, we can with some justice call him. Other two poets followed him and their names are known to us, but the personality of the great founder and arc poet Chu Yuan eclipsed them all, so that later generations tended to ascribe any old Chu poetry to him, and what started off as a collection of works of Chu Yuan and his school came in time to be thought of consisting entirely or almost entirely of the works of the master. I will end with Hawk's own ending to his section on Chi Yuan. The following lines may not have been written by the great master himself, but they echo what he more than once stated in the Li Sao. The world is muddy witted None can know me. The heart of a man cannot be told. I know that death cannot be avoided. Therefore, I will not grudge its coming. To noble men, I here plainly declare that I will be numbered with such as you. <laughs>